1859, he published his book. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole details about him stealing somebody else's information. That's for another day. Long story short, he published a book we commonly refer to as The Origin of Species. I'm going to give you the full title because we don't talk about it very much anymore. In fact, most copies, you can't even find the full title. The full title of Darwin's book was The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle of Life. Favored Races? Yeah. We don't like to publicize that much, do we? But it meant, it's at, it meant everything that you think it did. In fact, in his second book, The Descent of Man, Charles Darwin just came right out and said, the Negro race of humans is closer to the chimps than the Caucasians. Now, let's talk about that for a second. Folks, I don't care where you are on the spectrum, evolution is teaching racism to our kids. And here's why I say that. If I were to ask all the college students in this room, what country did man allegedly evolve out of? If they've actually been paying attention, they'll say Africa, specifically the Afar region of Africa. Now, in your textbooks, what do those early humans look like? Well, let's see, they got lots of hair, they're kind of dark skinned, and okay, what about white man? Where did he come from? Oh, he came about two or three hundred thousand years later and came walking down out of Europe. And folks, I don't care how you look at it. That is teaching that the white race is further evolved than the dark skin race. That, that is teaching that one is superior to the other. That's racism to a T. And yet that's what we're teaching. Dr. Harum says that preservation of favor races means everything you think it did. But no, it doesn't mean what he's trying to make it sound like it means. In fact, race is an unofficial level of taxonomy, or category of classification. It's a word that in Darwin's time would have meant breeds. Modern biologists still use this term when referring to groups below the subspecies level, like the races of the western honeybee. It's falling out of use because of misunderstandings like the one that Dr. Harib is trying to dishonestly promote. Darwin was talking about how groups within a species, that is, races, can be favored by possessing some advantageous trait. If you judge Charles Darwin by modern sensibilities, he was unenlightened on a number of social issues. He existed in a world where women couldn't vote, where slavery still existed, and where the poor worked long hours in factories for little wages. Judging him by the lights of his own time, however, he was not a racist. His politics were very progressive, and his thinking surprisingly enlightened, given the times. He was an outspoken abolitionist, an opponent of slavery, from a family of abolitionists, and he wrote extensively on the hatred he had of that abominable institution, as he witnessed it in his travels. It was a topic that led to frequent heated arguments with his shipmates on the Beagle, particularly Captain Fitzroy. Recall that, at the time, slavery was a biblically endorsed institution, condoned as it is in the Old Testament and practiced by those under personal commandment by God. Really, I could go on about Darwin, but I'd rather simply let his own words defend him. Here he is in personal correspondence on the topic of the American Civil War. Some few, and I am one, even and wish to God, though at the loss of millions of lives, that the North would proclaim a crusade against slavery. In the long run, a million horrid deaths would be amply repaid in the cause of humanity. Great God, how I would like to see the greatest curse on earth, slavery, abolished. From the Descent of Man, 1871. As man advances in civilization and small tribes are united into larger communities, the simplest reason would tell each individual that he ought to extend his social instincts and sympathies to all the members of the same nation, though personally unknown to him. This point being once reached, there is only an artificial barrier to prevent his sympathies extending to the men of all nations and races. If indeed such men are separated from him by great differences in appearance or habits, experience unfortunately shows us how long it is before we look at them 
as our fellow creatures. And elsewhere in the same book, it may be doubted whether any character can be named which is distinctive of a race and is constant. But the most weighty of all the arguments against treating the races of men as distinct species is that they graduate into each other, independently in many cases, as far as we can judge of their having intercrossed. If I can translate that, by the way, he's saying that people everywhere are basically the same, regardless of recent intermarriage or cultural exchange. From The Voyage of the Beagle, 1839. I thank God I shall never again visit a slave country. To this day, if I hear a distant scream, it recalls with painful vividness my feelings. When passing a house near Pernambuco, Brazil, I heard the most pitiable moans, and I could not suspect that some poor slave was being tortured. Near Rio de Janeiro, I lived opposite to an old lady who kept screws to crush the fingers of her female slaves. These are not the concerns of someone who believes one race to be superior to another. The assertion by Dr. Harrop that Darwin suggested that Africans were closer to chimpanzees had no basis in fact. The only thing I can imagine is that he's confusing the arguments made by the creationists of Darwin's era, who styled themselves polygenists and believed that God created humans multiple times as different races, so that Adam was the ancestor only of Europeans. Evolution, of course, does not say that white people emerged from Europe. In fact, it says that we all have a single common origin, and that everyone alive today is closely related, and the majority of all our ancestors lived in Africa. As to Dr. Harib's theory that evolution promotes racism, I suggest he look at where racism has flourished most strongly in the U.S. Is it among the most educated, the researchers and professors in liberal New England, or is it more common among Bible-believing Christians in areas like his own Tennessee or my own Texas, in the heart of the Bible Belt? Anyone who can't answer that question hasn't been paying attention. Thanks for watching. Genetic information coded onto the DNA molecules. The model.